So what does it mean to be a new creation in Christ? It's familiar language. To us, we, we come across this idea all throughout the New Testament. In some ways, it may seem like this idea of being a new creation in Christ is simply an intellectual idea. It, it only matters in how we understand what we believe as Christians. Or it may seem as though it is only something that would describe maybe a super-Christian. You know, that, that person that we believe has somehow completely put off sin and doesn't seem to have the struggles of the flesh anymore like we do. Well, neither of these ideas are what Paul is getting at when he talks about this idea of new life, of being a new creation. Because for Paul, the idea of having died with Christ and now having a new life in him is extremely practical. And yes, it's a great theological truth, but Paul doesn't make theological points just to make a point. He always has a how you live your life on the ground implication for what he is teaching. And in our passage for today, we're going to see how Paul envisions the Christian life. And there are three main ideas that we come away from this passage, and you may have even noticed them right as we were reading through it because they stand out so distinctly. The first one is that we're to set our minds on things that are above. And we're gonna see that, that Paul isn't telling us that we are supposed to have our head in the clouds, but that we are to remember that Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and we have victory over all the forces, all the things that would come up against us. And so we are to set our minds on things that are above. And secondly, we're gonna see that we need to put sin to death. We're to understand that this victory that we have through Jesus is not a license to sin and do whatever we want. Sin is contrary to God's law, and therefore it is contrary for how God intends for us to live. And living in sin is not for us. It is who we once were. But now that we are in Christ, we are called to holiness. And lastly, we will see that we do not just stop doing the things that are bad. We don't merely throw out the bad things and get rid of the old person. We're also called to put on the new self, a self that reflects the goodness and the love that we have been shown by God. So as we come to our passage today, we're going to see something that is familiar to us. We see this all the time in the writings of Paul. In the previous two chapters, he's shown us the majesty of Christ. He's spelled out what has been done for us to save us. And he wants us to know that, that not only is Jesus good enough to save us, it's sufficient for all that we need. And we know clearly from the first two, two chapters here in Colossians who we are in Christ Jesus. He made sure that this was clear for us. Now he's gonna show us how this good news shapes who we are and how we live and how we're formed to love others. In other words, Paul has made absolutely sure, absolutely for certain that we know what has been done for us before he tells us what we need to do. He doesn't want there to be any doubt that somehow we read this and say, I better do this so that I'm approved by God. No, he's saying, you are in Christ. You have been forgiven, so now these are the things that you do. He wants us to know for sure that we've been saved by God and that our lives are a response to our being saved. And we, we see this as we are told right off the bat to set our minds on the things that are above. It jumps right out at us as we look at this first section of scripture for this morning. And notice these first two words up there. It says, if then. Now, our natural human assumption on those, those two words is usually, if, if then you want to be saved, then you better behave yourself and, and be a good person. But like I said before, Paul has already told us that we are in Christ. And the Bible doesn't teach that if then, if you can do something certain, then you can be saved. Paul's words are clear. His point is that you have been raised with Christ. And so you don't need to dwell on things that are sinful anymore. Instead, stop all your speculation and your trust in earthly things and seek the things 
that are above. He's telling us to trust in the sure truth of Jesus because he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is victorious. All the things that we think we need for spiritual ascent are fruitless because Jesus instead came to us in his life, death, resurrection. In his ascension now, he shows us that he is victorious and above all things, over all powers that might hold us captive. And this message that he has to set your mind on things above is not telling us that we should have our heads in the clouds and be of no earthly good. Instead, the, the idea is that we need to remember who is victorious. Set your minds on things above. Jesus has sat down. He has won his victory and he sat down. Put your mind then there. There is no earthly power that has dominion over us. We've all probably had some sort of anxiety, right? Over, over a power that somebody holds over us. Maybe it's a teacher that you had once and you just had anxiety. You felt that they were absolutely out to get, to, out to get you. Maybe it was an employer that held your employment and the entire livelihood of your family over you in order to control you, to get you to do what they wanted to do, to make you work more. I'm sure we can all imagine some sort of scenario where we've had our mind on the earthly powers instead of on the heavenly power who truly holds our lives. And that's the idea that we're to see here. None of the stuff that the church in Colossae is struggling with can be greater than God's hold over them in Christ. No earthly person that has control over you is greater than God's control over you. And this is why he says that you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Who you are in Christ is now what determines your fate. No matter what happens, your salvation is secure. And Paul says here, when he appears, you will also appear with him in glory. So no matter the struggles of this life, we have an assurance that in the end, we are victorious in Christ. We don't need to be stressed out about whether things are going to fall apart at the end. This, this isn't like watching a football game and you just know that your favorite team is going to mess it, mess it up at the end. I, I think back to this past Sunday evening game where the Vikings were playing. If you watched that game, you had to be a little nervous, right? It was, it was in doubt up to the end. There was stress, and even I felt it, because my second favorite team is whoever's playing the Cowboys. It went down to almost the very last second. The game was up for grabs, and thankfully that team in purple came through. But the issue was in doubt. You had to wonder if there was going to be victory. Were they going to mess it up again? And Paul wants us to know that the Christian life isn't like a football game that goes down to the wire as the final seconds tick away and you're wondering if it'll all work out. Instead, if I were to make a correlation with a football game on how the Christian life should look, I would actually think about uh, that controversial South Dakota playoff game from a couple weeks back. Maybe you've heard about it, maybe you haven't. Uh, but Peer and Spearfish played in the first round of the playoffs. And Peer beat Spearfish 103 to nothing. Now, there's no mercy rule in Class AA. I, I guess it's because they have to travel so far for their games in Class AA in South Dakota. They don't want to cut a game short. Uh, but Peer was actually pretty merciful. They only played their starters for 24 plays before they put in the backups. And so a lot of the score was done by sophomores and freshmen. But anyway, there was never a doubt who the victor of that game was going to be. But the game wasn't over yet, right? It was 103 to nothing. The game was secure. Pierre was going to win. It was over. But the final seconds had not ticked off. They couldn't celebrate yet. But finally, when the clock mercifully ticked to zero, they could celebrate the victory that they had. And that's the idea that we get from Paul here. Your victory in Christ is a certainty. It's more than 103 to nothing. It's a billion to nothing. You are victorious in Christ. And when the final seconds tick off and Christ returns at the end of history to deliver his kingdom to his Father, it says here that you will appear with him in glory. Your victory is secure. And in the end, you will be with him. 
And so we've seen in this first section of our passage the important truth that we should set our minds on things above. And now we're going to see more deeply what this means for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And first, we see here that we are putting sin to death. And this is the language that Paul uses, and it's strong language. We are not to put our sin in a closet and keep it around in case we want it later. We're to put it to death. It is to be killed, put in a box, and buried. And notice the, notice the word he uses about these things, that they're earthly. Notice the contrast he's making. You're to set your mind on things above, and he's telling us to put away these earthly things. Our mind is to be on Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we are to put to death those earthly, sinful things of this world. And he then doesn't leave us to speculate what these things are. He spells it out very clearly in terms that we can understand. And the list is pretty comprehensive. And it starts out with what we would expect to be on a list of things that we should put to death. And the two words here, sexual immorality, comes from one Greek word. And even if you don't know Greek, when I say this Greek word, you'll get it. The Greek word here is porneia. It's where we get the root word for the word pornography. All of this, it's all sexual immorality. It covers all kinds of illicit sexual behavior. It covers fornication, homosexuality, adultery, and everything else that is outside God's defined parameters for sexual activity. And while often we feel like this type of thing is, is more of a problem in our culture, it was a huge issue in their culture too. And sure, it's pushed upon us with modern technology and means of communication, but in ancient times, they would see it promoted to them too. And what we need to understand is that there's an inherent connection between the pagan beliefs that these people used to have and how they viewed this type of immorality. Their participation in it was not just acknowledging that you had these desires that you wanted fulfilled, but there was also something inherently pagan and there was an underlying religiosity about them. And so God set his laws as a standard of holiness for us as individuals. But also this law forbidding these things was God saying, you, as my people, you are living in contrast to the pagan nations and their pagan sense of immorality. As you may remember me saying before, the word holy literally means to be set apart. And the law of God told them how to live, and it also showed them how to be different from their neighbors, to be set apart. And this is a huge call on us in our time because as you have probably noticed, if you're paying attention, there is almost a religious devotion to the way that sexual immorality is presented in our culture. And as we see here in Colossians, we must resist it because we are to have our minds not on earthly things, but on things that are above, not on the things of this world. But there's also something else here that we need to notice about being set apart and being holy. It's easy for us to look at the sin and the depravity and the rebellion in our world and feel pretty good about ourselves because we're not like the world that Paul is describing here. But he keeps on talking and his description of sin cuts deep. There's impurity, there's passion, evil desire and covenous, and all of these things here are related to sexual morality, and they're all temptations that we face. And notice what it says about covetousness. It's idolatry, it's something that we put in the place of God. All sin is us putting our desires in the front and deciding that we are the ones who get to determine what right and wrong is. We are God. We will determine truth but to be set apart and to be holy. We must put to death these things and instead trust in what God has given us. Because we read here that the wrath of God is coming against these things. He will punish it. And while it may seem that these type of things are going unpunished now, we know that one day the wrath of God will come. He will judge these sins and the punishment will be just because his law has been violated. But we must also notice here there's good news in this. Paul says that these people in Colossae, they used to walk this way. 
There's freedom from these things. Their sin was not explained away as being, okay, now that you believe the right stuff about Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do. Instead, Paul says, you used to be like this. Their newness of life in Jesus has caused them to live their lives in a different way. They're no longer slaves to sin, but instead they're walking a righteous life that is set apart. And we continue to see what those things are that we should flee. Things like anger, lying, obscene talk. All of these things run contrary to what God has ordained for our lives to look like. And we're to put these things away. We're to put them to death. That was the old self. And because God in Christ through the Holy Spirit is at work in us, we're called to a different way of life. We are new creations. And as new creations, there's no distinction between people based upon human categories. Instead, we're united by the fact that we are being made into the image of the one who died for us. We're being made holy as Christians, and we're doing it together. We're not there yet, but we're moving towards a goal. But these things can be so difficult to put away. Putting sin to death is really hard, right? When I think about the difficulty of putting sin to death, it reminds me of something I read about poisonous snakes once. Now, I'm not a fan of snakes at all. It may be one of the top three reasons I live as far north as I do, okay? No poisonous snakes. Anyway, I saw this article that even if you kill a venomous snake, it can still get you after it's dead. A hospital in Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix area, reported of 35 snake bites over the course of a 10-month period. And of those 35 snake bites, five of them were for snakes that were dead. One guy had decapitated a rattlesnake, and it still bit him after the fact, and he ended up losing one of his index fingers from the bite. And doesn't that illustrate our struggle with sin perfectly? You think you have put something behind you. You think you've put it to death, but then we fall into it again, and we're forced to struggle with the fact that it wasn't fully dead. And this is why we must put on the new self. As we put our mind on things above and we put sin to death in our lives, we are told by Paul that putting sin to death isn't just being neutral to the things around us. Putting on the new self is something else entirely. It's a life of good works. We're not just rejecting the sinful pagan lifestyle that's contrary to God and his law. We're not living a neutral life here. Unless you're Switzerland, being neutral doesn't work very well. It's hard. Paul calls us to put on the new self, not just be neutral. And he's going to tell us what that looks like. We are God's chosen. We are his set apart ones. And so we're called to have compassionate hearts. We're to be kind. We are to be meek. We're to be humble and patient. If we have problems with one another, he says we're not to hold grudges, but instead forgive because the Lord has first forgiven us. This is a life of thanksgiving. We love because he first loved us as we read in 1 John. And this is what we're called to look like as believers. We put on love because that is what binds everything together. And while it is hard to resist the temptations of the world, this is what we're called to do. And we put on these things to stand in contrast to the sinfulness of the world. But as I said, doing this is hard It is so much easier for us to just say that we aren't doing a particular sinful thing and then look down on others instead of putting on the things that we're called to do. So much easier to look at others instead of looking at ourselves and see whether or not we're reflecting this life that God has called us to do. And we're going to see in our application how we do this, but this breakdown in this passage is very easy to see. We we set our minds on things that are above. We put sin to death. And we also put on the new self. As I said, this is pretty clear, but what, we, what do we come away with here? How does this breakdown of this passage translate into your life in the coming week? And there's three applications for us today. The first is to seek the things that are above. Like I said, this doesn't mean that we have our heads in the clouds or that we are so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. 
Instead, it means that as life comes at us, we remember that we have a king in heaven who has made us right with God. And no matter what comes our way in this life, we are secure in him. And this translates into our daily lives as thanksgiving, as we have seen in this passage. When we understand what God has done for us and the status we have in the heavenly places, it translates into an earthly desire to love and serve our neighbor. And so we seek the things that are above, remembering that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And so then we put sin to death, and we need to be honest about our sin. If we're going to put sin to death, we need to take this challenge. We have to be honest with what we struggle with. In the list of sins that are to be put to death in this passage, whatever your struggle is, whether it's related to sexual immorality, maybe you struggle with anger or slander, maybe it's obscene talk, maybe you struggle with telling the truth, whatever it is, you can't put it to death if you don't acknowledge that it is sin. And most importantly, if you don't acknowledge that it's a sin that Jesus died for. You can't move forward without removing roadblocks. We've all been driving down the road, and you see that the construction is clearly done, but they leave the barriers up. And you sit there wondering, why in the world am I not driving on that side of the road? It's done. It's nice. But you can't get there because there's roadblocks in the way. Your life in Christ is like that. You're a new creation in Christ. God's construction is there. Open the roadblocks. Let yourself on to being a new creation. But we can't do that if we're not honest about the roadblocks that are in our way. Then lastly, we see how we do that. We remember who we are. On May 28th of 1972, the Duke of Windsor, who was the uncrowned King Edward VIII, uh, he died in Paris. And that evening, television programs all over the world were talking about his death, and they were recounting the main events of his life. And people watched this film footage in which he answered questions about his upbringing, you know, being in the royal family, what was that like, his brief reign as king, and then his eventual abduction, or not abduction of the throne, he didn't steal it, abdication of the throne, why he gave it up. And he was recalling his boyhood being Prince of Wales, and this is what he said, my father, King George V, was a strict disciplinarian. Sometimes when I had done something wrong, he would admonish me saying, my dear boy, you must always remember who you are. And this advice holds true for us as Christians. We are children of the King. And because we are in Christ, we must remember this truth about us. And because of him, we are able to put sin to death. Because we are in Christ, we can put on the new self because of him. We can let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts because we are in him. And we see one of the ways that we're able to do this is we look at this passage once again. We let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And this is where we learn who we are. The word of Christ is where we hear who we are. It's where we're reminded of the truth. But there's something really important I want you to catch in these two verses about remembering who we are. It's something that we do together. Look at the words there, teach and admonish. You don't teach and admonish on your own. It says to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, not only to build ourselves up, but notice we're to build up one another. Because seeking the things above, putting sin to death, and remembering who we are is a communal activity. We do this together. We build up each other in faith. We encourage each other, not just here when we hear one another confessing our faith, confessing our sins, singing hymns, songs, and spiritual songs together, but also when we see each other in the community. We build each other up together. We must remember to keep our minds on things above, that we are together putting sin to death and reminding one another who we are. And so with all of this truth we have seen in this passage,
let us build one another up, that we might be a witness to the world of what Christ has done and who he has made us to be together so that whatever we do, as it says here, in word or deed, we will do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the call on our lives. So may we go from here remembering the truth of who we are in Christ and go and love and serve our neighbors. Amen.